<sighs> okay. So to all of you out there, welcome back to So Shameless. Uh, this is part two of our History of Violence series. Again, I reached out to a uh, domestic violence, domestic abuse advocate, Shanita Francis. She has joined us today again. Um, and once again, I'd like to offer, before I introduce our guest, I'd like to offer a trigger warning for anybody out there that has suffered domestic violence, suffered domestic abuse, and also had a, uh, unnerving memories of their childhood. This is an episode where we brought in a child abuse therapist, I believe, or... <laughs> No, I'm just a therapist. Just a therapist, yeah. but with the history, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Working speaking about mm -hmm. um, child abuse. Danielle Good, welcome, Thank Danielle, you. to you. the couch, the So Shameless couch. Mm -hmm. um, for a long time, we spoke about, you know, the men versus women wars and, you know, $200 dates and, you know, would you, if, the, if you're, would you, who sits in the front seat, your girlfriend or your mom? <laughs> <laughs> um, but of late, I've wanted to impact the word that you used yeah. on me earlier i want to impact our community and a method that's just more it just felt more like soul food to me something that i felt our community could walk away with now mm -hmm. my co-host i asked my co-host to stand down for this one specifically because i spoke on domestic violence my history with it and i just didn't feel i wanted to attack that myself um, to anybody out there that's wondering, yes, the co my co-host Dodge, Tron, they'll be back next week. Well, you guys know Tron is on hiatus, but Dodge will be back next week. Um, so, yes, trigger warning to any and everybody that's been through it. I cried twice <laughs> last episode. So I can imagine how this may feel when certain things are unraveled um, by... What is up with Shanita? Can I talk to you? Can I talk to y'all like she's not in the room? Okay. What is up with this girl making me cry like that on my own show? <laughs> <laughs> like, it was easy. She didn't even, like, get aggressive. She was just, like, asking questions. I was like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> call me tender. <laughs> oh, not, like, I know. We, we changed it. We said resilient. We changed it. I wouldn't use that word to describe you anymore. I promise. <laughs> it kind of go tender, Tahoe. I, I didn't want to say it, but since you did, this we can go one. with it, right? The screen, are they here? <laughs> this isn't on the screen here, isn't on. Um, so yes, welcome, Danielle. Thank you. Um, before we get into anything, I'd like for you to introduce yourself. Let us know who you are, what you do. Sure. Um, my name is Danielle Good. I am a therapist, and typically the clientele that I have, um, let me say what they come with and usually what we talk about we talk about childhood trauma um, a lot of it really we're having conversations about boundaries mm. and so it's a perfect kind of um, marrying of when we're talking about things that we've experienced where people have violated us mm -hmm. and so whether it's childhood trauma or even trauma in relationships as adults mm -hmm. and so we, we do a lot of work around emotional boundaries physical boundaries mm -hmm. Um, I also work with clients who have anxiety, right? And so again, boundaries help with that. We understand um, how we think, how we feel, impact how we behave, mm -hmm. and they all impact one another. So what we do impacts then how we feel mm -hmm. and what we think. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of the work that I do. I also um, work with couples. And so that's like one of my favorite population to work with. Um, we talk about different dynamics and, and, and building the relationships and then allowing their relationship to be stronger. But my job isn't to keep them together, more so for them to come to that conclusion. Can it work, mm. right? Through lots of questioning, I think my, my uh, line is be curious. Mm. I think we stop being curious in our relationships. Mm. Um, and even with ourselves, even for our own personal development, what questions can we ask ourselves mm -hmm. to, to get deeper and to have a better understanding about who we are or who our partners are? <sighs> She, I, I need to hire her. I, I brought some. I, I'm gonna just heavy yeah. hitters. No, for across real. Across the board. Across the board. Because anxiety. Mm -hmm. Carmelia and I were speaking about this the other day, and I was like, yo, I think I have anxiety. Mm -hmm. And people wouldn't expect that from me because, again, I put on that, you know, I'm Tahoe, I'm straight, I did all of this and that. But, bro, that 
ball in my stomach and my chest gets like almost so hard to breathe sometimes when I'm thinking about something I'm going through or what move I make. Even sometimes as a public speaker, mm-hmm. I just get that uh, and, I, and I sometimes I freeze up. So it's, it's so funny um, that that happens to me specifically. Um, and you know they often um, mistake anxiety they it gets diagnosed as adhd sometimes mm. yeah so that's something to think about i know you mentioned something like that before, sure, I got I, but those are like they could be there they they're often seen together but they're often mistaken for each other as well too so it's something to look into as well could it go the other way could i not have anxiety and just have adhd or am i trying to hold on to adhd to make up for <laughs> <laughs> horrible behavior because <laughs> she's like why do you always bring it up yeah. adhd <laughs> all the time <laughs> listen ever since I, I, I saw reading up on it i'm like oh this you know, explains a lot i i look at adhd as something that's more like a guidepost like it kind of helps us understand our symptoms mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. it's a collection of things that happen it's a it's a real diagnosis mm-hmm. um i'll start there but often it's like almost like a starting point of understanding a lot of behaviors that you've had over a, a mm-hmm. long period of time. Mm-hmm. So that's what I've, I've used I for me. It's like, oh, now I know what this is, exactly. right? You know what I mean? It's not something that's like debilitating in that sense. It's more like it sounds to me, it feels like to me the diagnosis of ADHD is like a spring point. Like, mm. okay, now I can start to see that those behaviors, those, those things are what I'm... Well. It's funny with the ADHD thing, right? Because when I read it, reading on it, it's like it's supposed to be like a child thing. But at one point, what point do you graduate from ADHD if you, <laughs> if you get older? Like, it, I think it's more about like how we're taught to navigate it, mm-hmm. right? And so we know in schools, they're quick to throw out the diagnosis. Oh, your kid has ADHD, put him on medication. Mm. Um, and so there's sometimes that controversy of medication versus talk therapy. Mm-hmm. And so part of the framework that I use is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? And so that's the, it's a triangle where we talk about the thoughts, the feelings, and the behavior. And so real quick back to what you were saying about the misdiagnosis of ADHD for anxiety and then connected it to childhood, right? Like anxiety is also a symptom of, can be a symptom of trauma. Mm. right so it gets misdiagnosed and we're treating the symptom not the problem mm. and so we need to go to what, back what, to the problem what was the trauma what was it that was happened because now anxiety is your way of dealing right it's this thing happened whether it's i got in a car accident so now i'm in the car I'm like, and you be going 20 20 miles per hour right and so we have to deal with what are your thoughts about being in a car and what safety means what is the feeling you remember you talking about like you feel it in your chest, mm-hmm. but you sometimes we can't identify it because as kids, right? What are we told? Unball your fist. Mm-hmm. Stop stomping your feet. Mm-hmm. Stop yelling. You better fix your face. Why are you, you fix fidgeting? Your face. Yeah, put so your hands face. around your, to your sides. Sit down. We lose connection yeah. with our physio- physiological feelings. We lose connection because we were told you can't. So now we're like, I gotta, I gotta ignore it. I can't pay attention to what my body's telling me, and so now. I no longer have that connection. So I talk to my clients like, what are you feeling? Even when you're excited, we're like, kids, we're like, yes! And mm-hmm. we're like, calm down. It's like, mm-hmm. But I'm excited. It's an appropriate expression to excitement. Being, bowling up your fist, it's an appropriate expression. But we tell our kids, unfold your fist, unfold your arms. Yeah. We're so smart now. <laughs> In 2024. We? we have so much information now in 2024. Now you have words like anxiety. You have words like trauma. You have lactose intolerance. I bring that up because when I was a kid, I hated milk. Mm, it made you feel bad? It didn't make, I, I didn't realize it made me, I, I didn't realize, but I was kept, kept telling me to eat this. And something inside me was like, this doesn't feel good to me. I don't like this. Mm-hmm. But they, there was no lactose intolerance back then. There was no ADHD back then. They just said, he has a lot of energy. He doesn't focus. He's like, he, he's disruptive. Was it or were we lazy in like trying to figure Our out? Our parents? Parents, physicians. Mm. 
right? People think autism is new, but there's 40-year-olds that have autism. Can't be that new then. Mm. So what about like, is it what about the science? Or what about the studying? Or what about just like taking the time to really understand, right? Like what's happening with our kids and what we're saying to really get to understand what is the actual issue. Mm. I think it's easy to be like, oh, you're bad. Because what does ADHD, autism, lactose intolerance mean to a single mom who's working two jobs that is underpaid and just wants her kid to behave in school? She does not care about that. You think I'm, it's lazy? No, I'm not saying it's not laziness. It's more like utility, right? Like it's mm-hmm. more about what, like why you ain't sitting down in class. That's what I need to know. I don't better not get another call from that That's school. It. That's it. I don't want to hear, I'm, I, I don't have no time to be talking to a doctor about ADHD. Is there a cure for it? Mm. <laughs> is there something that you could do? Is it going to stop is me knowing? So I'm, I'm not excusing, you know, this practice that we may have of kind of just like trying to listen. It's the solution. What's the solution? What am I going to, what do I need to do? Do I need to beat this? Do I need to beat him? You know what I mean? Do I need to take his video game from him? What is it? I'm just going to do that because I don't really have time to sit with, all of these other things, I really just want him to sit down in class because I can't get another call at my job. But what what about the, there's nothing wrong with my child? Like, are you telling me there's something wrong with my child? Are you telling me that I did something? There was there was a lot of that too mm-hmm. um, growing up. Not necessarily in my house, but more so mm-hmm. like, I could see a parent going, no, that's not that. He just needs to sit his ass down. To sit, yeah, or a spanking or, you know. I spoke to my mom a lot uh, the other day about how I grew up. She does not remember me getting spanking. She said I had three spankings. <laughs> not three. She counted. She said you had three spankings. I'm not surprised when you said the same shit. Sounds about right. Three. Um, you know, three. three. I'll tell you. Damn. I said, Ma. The audacity. And you deserve respect, all three of them, correct? I said, I respect your you know perception of it but i need you to understand as a child my world was a lot smaller than yours Mm. you had nine brothers and sisters five of which lawyers engineers all of these things and then you had some who weren't as successful you had just broken up with your husband you were young you felt this pressure, you know, from everybody looking at you like you got this young kid, what are you gonna do? The fire department is doing something outside. Hold on a second. Cause them windows is open. Cause listen, I don't know, I have central AC, so y'all chill out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Some dressing dripping in thank my eye. <laughs> So what I was saying is that my your world was bigger than mine. You was the only child? Yes. The only child, Pisces, growing up in Brooklyn. She and never had another child. No. No. Okay. Now, you know, I was like, you had the fact that you just broke up with your husband. The broke fact up, that you have all of these siblings. Hmm? Broke up or what was the what were this the My mom was like, Listen, I'm bored and she left him. Okay. She was like, He smoked too much weed. He doesn't want to do anything other than sit in the house. And my life is bigger than that. And I, I, for a long time, thought that my dad did something. I thought he cheated. Mm -hmm. I thought he's just a piece of, you know. And she was like, no. One day I just knew that that wasn't my life. Mm. That's not, this is not a life I'm going to have. That I have to cook for this man. He's going to sit there and smoke and watch kung fu movies. And I'm not even getting anything out of this relationship anymore. So she left. She went back to her mom's crib. But there you have my 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 grandfather who was extremely abusive, mm. and I you know I can't speak on her her experience, but they all have spoken on it a lot, and it's like yo he was a lot. Mm. Um, my grandfather and I had a tumultuous relationship. He didn't like kids, and I'm talking about physically he didn't like kids. Physically, like he would do stuff, so we mm. stayed away from him, and that was there you know recollection as well like yo he was a lot to deal with just stay away from jp mm. you know what i'm saying um but yeah i was like ma 
what you remember back then is there's a lot more to the information you're taking in. You got work, you got trying to get home, you got to cook, you got to think about what the, the judgment from your friends or whatever. You broke up with your husband, you got to stand the other. All I had was my mom. All I had was what happened in that house. That's it. That was my world. I had, I had no information come from anywhere else. So I remember a lot more because that was all the information I was getting at that time. Yo, you was, it was a lot. So we sat with that and she, you know, was very apologetic and stuff. And I was like, listen, you have to also remember that you learned this from somewhere else. And your impulses came from a lot of other things as well. And I think about intent. I know my mother loved me to death. And she was scared that she wouldn't be enough. She was trying to serve two, as two parents. My father was not around, bro. My father showed up once a month because the court told him to or whatever. I got in his car. He drove me to his new house. And I went in the room with his new kids. And I didn't see him until it was time to go home. Mm. His wife basically took care of us while he did whatever. So I can see how my mom leave him because <laughs> I didn't even see the guy. I didn't have any experiences with him. So my mother was trying to do a lot to make sure that I was okay. And I'm not sure that she knew corporal punishment wasn't a good thing or wasn't a great thing because that was her experience. Mm -hmm. That's what all her brothers and sisters, that's what their experience was. Um, so yeah. Three spankings. That's that's that was that's my that's my story. Well, I mean, you talked a little bit about how you, you know, that was your world, and you really vividly remember that. Can you paint a picture for us, like when you talk about these spankings, this kind of like this? Uh, give us a visual, like tell us what those things okay. were like. Okay, so that was like. I want to say this real quick before I say that. Well, I remember you asked me this question the other day. Mm -hmm. When did it start? Mm -hmm. My mother didn't always spank me. Mm. Me and my mother was like brothers and sisters up until a point. Like laugh, joke, spend all time together. It was just always watch this movie, sing, you know. But I was becoming the person that y'all know today. And I was starting to talk, you know, funny and crack jokes and whatever it may be. And that may be b because of the situation that we spoke about the other day, you know, I was becoming more rebellious in a way. And I remember one of my aunts told my mother one day, one of my older aunts, he doesn't respect you. Mm. Your son does not respect you because my son would never mm. speak to me that way. And after that, I remember she turned up. It got serious. It got a lot heavier. And it was almost as if she was going to get me to respect her in the way that she felt her sister felt wasn't there. Those beatings felt angry. Mm -hmm. It wasn't hate, right? But it was wrath. Rage. It was rage. Mm -hmm. It was rage. Mm -hmm. Um... And I don't think that I, I, I don't know if I understood the connection between what I did and the rage that was ensuing afterwards. It was just, that's a lot for a kid. You know what I'm saying? Mm. As we got older, sometimes at some point, I was like, you're not hitting me no more. We're not doing that no more. <laughs> and so that changed into us having a phys physical relationship, me and my mom. You know, like I wasn't, you're just not going to just be beating me up. <laughs> and what did that look like when you said physical? Like you restraining her kind of like. Yeah, I didn't punch. My, I never punched okay. my mom, but they, I was definitely like grabbing her up. I definitely threw her in the closet once to close the door. Oh, OK. All right. Right. So it was yeah, like, yo, so you're wild. not. This is done. Yeah. That part of our life is over. This, mm -hmm. That's not going to continue. And it, it's disrespectful. Of you know, course, it's disrespectful. You know where it comes from, right? It's like control. Like if I can get you to bend, if I can get you to conform, it's it's a it's a means of controlling kids. You see your parents all the time. 
don't do that. You, you do it, you get popped. Right? Like, what are you doing? I'm going to pop you. There's no, there's no conversation because I think then maybe even some of our parents, even some parents still hold their parents and parents' philosophy. Children are to be heard, not seen. Right? And so your mom wanted this kind of respect and you were your own person. You call it rebellious. But maybe it was more of you were connecting to more who you felt genuine. Like, I feel true being a jokester. I feel true being this kind of person. And there was some perhaps uh, realization. Like, that's why I feel good being like this. I don't, like, I was this, but I actually feel good. But this is who I'm becoming. And mom, sis, yawn is like, that's eh, not, eh, eh. That's not you happening. need to control him, is what she was saying. Mm -hmm. Right? Because parents think. If I, ha if I have control, I get respect. Mm -hmm. Adults think that. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't respect me? You're your boss. You don't respect me? You get penalized. Or there's some type of consequence that ensues. Mm -hmm. And so that rage, too, is like, why aren't you listening? Why aren't you, like, get in line? Hey, no, go ahead. You want to say something? What about... <clears throat> The fr frustration single mothers have of trying to control, trying to raise little boys, and they're becoming. It's a it's a lot for them, especially as you said earlier, financial pressure. I don't know where we're gonna live from day to day. I got people judging me from day to day. I'm in a job that I don't even like. Mm. I have no help. I'm under consistent scrutiny. And this little nigga <laughs> is Ooh. not helping. He helping. He's everywhere. He's doing everything. You're sliding across the floor. <laughs> mm -hmm. In school. Yeah. It's embarrassing. You, it's, I, I would think that it was just a lot for her to deal with. And then you thought you just you talked about you really talked about the locus of control, right? Um, what I heard you saying, like another layer of what Danielle was saying. There's this thing called uh, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And at the bottom, are like your basic necessities: mm -hmm. food, shelter, um, what else? Like uh, safety, mm -hmm. right? Like survival stuff, right? And it it basically is saying that. At each level, those are kind of like the things that a person is focused on or thinking about. Like those are their needs, their immediate needs, right? Or the things that they are able to, um, the place that they're coming from, right? In their life. The top of that is like self-actualization, right? Like um, you are, you, you, once you've kind of secured what you're going to eat, where you're going to live, then you go to like the sense of belonging. Now you're really just trying to find a sense of belonging, acceptance, mm -hmm. Community. right? Community, right? Mm -hmm. Once you found that community, then you're trying to find like your purpose, your work. Mm -hmm. You know, there's these different levels that you achieve as you kind of, but if you haven't even, you're still thinking and vibrating in the first layer, right? I don't know where food is coming from every day. I mean, I, like think about that. Millionaires do not think about food. They don't think about housing. Those are not things that live on their brain on a daily basis. So I don't even get to make decisions in that other part of my life yet because right now, we talked about this before, the only thing that I'm thinking about that I'm vibrating on is my safety, is my security. Mm -hmm. um, as humans, we don't really graduate far when we have those basic needs mm -hmm. still attached to our like to our daily like. I could wake up and not really know how I'm going to feed my children. So you're, you're definitely going to be thinking on that level. Mm -hmm. And really that is what we call survival mode, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we call survival mode. Um, and when, when she was talking about control, it made me think about how, what are the things I can't control, right? If I got all these different variables, my boss, like you said, he's giving me, like, I know if I'm late, he might mm -hmm. take my money. Over here, I'm not getting respect from this place. The world looks at as me, you know, they look at me as second class, right? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not in control of really like my financial situation right now. All of these things, the one thing that I will, that I can control, that I feel like should I should have control over, is my child, right? So now I'm now I'm invested in 
having that control, that feels like a space where I can actually, me, this black woman that has all these variables, that's going through all these things that the world is looking at in this way, my child though? No, that's where I'm gonna assert that control. That's where I'm, I'm feeling like I should have that sense of control or that you better mind me. Mm. Like, so you think about that. It's not an, I don't wanna call it an abuse of power, but it's like, it if I have no other space where I'm control, like I, I'm have that authority, who do you think is gonna get the brunt of that feeling of like powerlessness that I have, right? Who's gonna who's gonna receive that? That nobody else is listening, but you are, mm-hmm. but you are, because this is what I can control. But I think we have to be better about that, though. Of course, right. I'm just that was like yeah, a synopsis. Yeah. That was yeah, just it is, and it's true, right? Mm-hmm. We that's where it comes out. It's like I'm supposed to have control over you. And one of the, the way the world has control over me. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and it is, it's like, where do I, in my home, I get to, that's where I feel most empowered because it's my space. Can't nobody come in here and tell me what to do. And can't nobody come in here with, and see what I'm doing and tell me how I'm supposed to raise my child. What do you think the child takes away from that? How does that imprint itself on the child? That's how you make bullies. Right, you're like, do what I say, <laughs> again, and there's some type. I'm gonna take something away from you. I'm gonna send you away. And so, our children are human beings, just like us. They have needs. They have ideas. They have perspectives. They have opinions, and they're all valid. It's part of our responsibility is to not um to to validate that for them. So they understand like, oh, what I say matters. It means we have to like slow down and realize, like I always, when I uh, work with couples or even if I work with women who are pregnant, I I told my cousin this one time when she was pregnant, I said, and she likes control. I said, you're pregnant now. You gotta relinquish that control because even from the child being in the womb, you don't have a say when that baby comes. Let it go. Wow. You have no say. That is like, to me, the first, like, tipping your toe in the water of parenting when it comes to your child and not having control. You don't have a say when that baby comes. You don't have a say what you want like. You think you like that food. You think you like that watermelon. You want to upchuck it because baby don't like it. Doesn't, it doesn't mix well. Your baby's like, eh. I don't want that. I don't want that. I want some steak. And you're like, I don't, really, I don't eat beef and beef is... But guess what? <laughs> Baby wants steak. Baby wants steak. Babies are the biggest oh. bosses. I say that all the time. They the biggest bosses. And ever. when they're born, <laughs> they know when they want to eat. Mm-hmm. They know when they want to sleep. But we have to really like, it's a different kind of re- like letting go because it shakes up our world. I love the saying, um, when a child is born, so too is the mom for she has never been a mother before. It's the same thing with the dads. I also kind of feel like we need to include the dads into that Mm -hmm. because they they have an experience they're not caring, but they're impacted by it no matter what. Mm -hmm. Um, And so to, you know, Shanita's talking about like that survival mode we're in. I, I, I get it. My mom is in California. My sister lives in Harlem and I moved to New Jersey now. And all, and And my friends are helpful, but like everyone has their own lives. And we really live in a world today where we're not growing up with our, our friends, kids. Like we grew up with like, you go into my friend is your aunt. And so now I grew up with her kids and I grew up with my cousins. And now it's, everyone is just so heavily into their world that they don't know what it really means to raise. Like it takes a village. It really, really takes a village, but I'm in survival mode. Right. So now when I see my son do something, it's that constant, like, and I'm having a bad day, or he's having a tough moment. He's not supposed to know. People may not like this, but I say, my child is not a little adult. He's a child until he becomes a young adult. He's a child. And so he's just as curious. He's trying to figure out my, like, why is she snapping? Why is she flipping out? I'm just doing what a kid does. But we gotta be okay with that. We wanna control, don't run, don't, why not? But why not, right? And for me, I try to, I try my hardest, and it's hard, and I'm not perfect at this, but to remember when it comes to a safety thing is when perhaps the more serious conversations come in 
and when I think about more of like the consequences perhaps or how like we navigate that together or I navigate that for him or my daughter mm. when it's really a safe right because there's some things they can't per- they don't perceive as dangerous and we just we really do know mm. mm-hmm. we really are more the experts of like certain dangers mm-hmm. than they are because they just don't get it mm-hmm. um, but it's hard you said that's how a bully is born mm-hmm. Are people who do domestic violence bullies? Say that one more time. People who have done domestic violence or in domestic violence, are they bullies? Yes. Yeah. What do you think? What is the drive of a bully? What, if, if y'all can just help me with that. Mm-hmm. Like, what exactly is happening? Y- so we're saying, okay... This happened to you, and now because of that, you became this way. If you don't, if you've gotten good results from being a bully, right? I would often say t- t- in today's world, a lot of these kids, especially these people on social media, y'all never been slapped before. Y'all never been beaten before. Or y'all, ne- y'all never had a certain thing that mm-hmm. gets you to respect other people, mm-hmm. have empathy for other people, respect mm-hmm. yourself. You're just judgy, judgy, mean. Mm-hmm. You're just going off. You're doing the worst because there's no consequences. What exactly happens that makes the bully and what happens to them if they never break out of that like in teen junior high school teen uh high school so let's say my son is six and i because i feel like i'm his mom i really can like dictate everything he does tell him what to do he has no choice Literally, if I say turn off the TV without cause, there's nothing. Turn it off. Go to your room. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. I'm like really taking away his personhood. I'm taking away his sense of feeling like he has any autonomy. kind of say, autonomy. Mm-hmm. And so I am trying, if I can't do it here, I'm going to go to school in my next environment where I can exert that towards someone else or I just misbehave. Right, because I am trying, like, and now also with abuse or bullying, there's some emotional abuse that's happening, right? I'm completely disregarding how he feels, and he doesn't even know what to do with it because I leave no space for it. So now he's like, I got all this stuff bottled up, all this stuff bottled up. How do I, like, he, he's six. <laughs> I mean, adults don't even know what to do with a lot of their feelings, right? We see people, people adults go to anger management. Or we talk about emotional intelligence. People lack it, they don't have it. And so you asking what happens as adults, you lack emotional intelligence. You lack self-awareness. You lack mindfulness because you grew up in an environment where it wasn't fostered and there wasn't space for you to even explore it. Most bullies feel powerless inside, Mm -hmm. truthfully. And I know that's we, not how they present, though. Exactly. And we talked about it. it's really a power grab when you really think about it. It's really like almost like we talked about how you um, would go into the cafeteria, right? Maybe and mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you wow. you'd attack the mm-hmm. you attack the attacker before he attacks you. Like mm-hmm. I'm gonna be the biggest. I'm gonna I'm gonna control my environment before it controls me, mm-hmm. right? So now you're talking about a person who feels powerless, right? And we talked about fear, right? Some of the you know some of the biggest, craziest shooters, right? Street guys that did the craziest things are the ones that are scared, right? Like the ones that are scared. If you you, you come to a scared person, they gonna do you whatever. You might those those are the ones you gotta watch out for. Mm-hmm. Like if if you you know I'm not fighting with a person who's I like I actually told somebody shook. that a few years ago. I said you. You're starting to scare me. Mm-hmm. So whatever you're looking for, it's starting to work. Mm-hmm. Right. It's working. I'm, I'm becoming scared of you. And now I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what to do. So think about that. Scare people in a survival mode. Think about that. If a person is walking around scared all day, right, mm-hmm. they're going to do whatever they think they need to do to get a sense of control, to get a sense of power. And if that means taking it from you, if that means, you know, grabbing you up um, and, and putting you down before because I s- perceive you, like you said, survival mode. So I'm really perceiving things as threats around me, mm-hmm. right? You look, you, you're a little tall or you you look like you, you know, you might have jokes. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I came in school with these sneakers on. 
I already know before I walked in, the kids got probably gonna have something to say. So now I'm coming in there like I wish you would like mm-hmm. say something. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I'm I'm almost in a sense I'm being proactive and kind of trying to take that power from wherever I can get it from before somebody has a one up on me or has the ability to do that. And I think that that's what most bullies are walking around feeling I've, powerless. I remember speaking about going to Wegmans. Love Wegmans, by the way. Expensive. Expensive. <laughs> Haven't been to Wegmans in a long time. <laughs> oh, please, no. <laughs> Haven't been. <laughs> Listen. It's a little um, there was a mother a in there with her children. Mm-hmm. And she's like, come on. Stand mm-hmm. right here. And you motherfucking. Mm. There was a lot of that. So much that I had to stop and look like I kind of felt bad for the kids because I felt like whatever she was going through, the kids are now subject to the backlash because they not really whatever they're doing isn't worth all that energy. Right. But I do wonder how that energy consistently affects that child. What do y'all think about that? What do y'all see if you if you've seen children? that have had that type of upbringing, a hard upbringing, uh, uh, you know, with their child. My mother never spoke to me that, that way. She was very gentle and soft until discipline time. Mm-hmm. Discipline time was bad for me. And, you know, I spoke to her about this the other day. I was like, okay, say I didn't get no spankings. You remember the days that I didn't want to eat what you put in front of me? How long I had, you made me sit in front of that plate of food because I, I did not want to eat it? Mm-hmm. I was like, I would fall asleep on that food. And I, I'd get yelled at for falling asleep. <laughs> and she was like, I remember that. And I'm like, you think that was cool? Yeah. I didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want the food. That was it. I wasn't disobeying you. <laughs> I didn't want the food. <laughs> but, like, she, <laughs> but what but what were you going to eat? That's the thing. I, I, I'm, I just had to stop for a minute because I won't force my kids to eat my food. That, like that long are those days because my grandmother mm-hmm. used to do it to me, my great grandma. Um, but it was like she had these, she had this whole system. So it's like, if you don't eat this food at the time that I tell you eat this food, that impacts the rest of our day. Like, what are you going to eat? I'm going to be worried about what you're going to eat. So I just, I'm not making an excuse for mom, but I'm also, I understand that in her mind, you not eating her food wasn't just about you not eating the food and not wanting the food. It could have been about... This is what I have to offer you right now. This is what I have. It's not good enough. Like, what What am I going to do? I don't. We don't have nothing else. I'm not making anything else. That's going to be a whole another process. So I just feel like, you know, moms, p- parents are sometimes are systems thinkers, right? Like, they think about all the parts, right? Mm-hmm. Agreed. As a part of the whole, right? It's not, it's not like in silo. So you just eating your food is not just... Like you said, to you and that being the center of your whole, you know, day right there. Mm-hmm. Like that's all you're thinking about right now is I want this food. Mommy's thinking about like I cooked that food for five hours. Now it's time for bath time. I need him to be in the bath so I can get him to the to mm-hmm. school. I'm thinking about the next day what my commute is gonna be like. I'm like, I'm tight. Mm-hmm. I ain't gonna lie to you. I'm tight. Mm-hmm. Eat that food so we can move on. Can mm-hmm. I like, comment on that one? Yes. Cause <laughs> I'm in the middle of those two, mm-hmm. right? Like, I I, I promise myself. My son is like that. And I say, or sometimes I'll offer two things. No, he really is. He'll be like, oh, I don't want to eat. And I say, okay, so that means you're ready for bed? Mm-hmm. Which one? Because what I'm not going to do is I choose my battles. Mm-hmm. Right? And again, I think to this, like, we like to control. And because I did it, and some of it is a little selfish. It's, it's, it's a, I think sometimes we want our kids to appreciate us at a time where we have to teach gratitude. Mm. And we don't, we think it's an automatic thing. Some kids may kind of pick up on it naturally because that is like just generally, generally who they are. But like my kid, he'll be like, I don't want to say, okay, so you ready for bed? And I'm like, no, I want to eat. I said, okay, so then you have to eat, right? But I have conversation. Sometimes, mm. I don't think our parents always had the conversation mm. of our thinking, right? And so part of, right, always I think about like, how do I get my son to be a critical thinker? But some of that comes from dialogue. He cannot anticipate the things I can because he just doesn't have that foresight yet. Mm -hmm. But the way I get him to is is explaining. Okay, so it's my guy. 7.30, we got to wake up Mm -hmm. at 6 o'clock. And your day is till 6.30 because I work. 
I come with my commute and we I'm on a move, right? So I have to be mindful of it, but I want you to be mindful too. So I explained to him what we're doing. And I have and I'm <laughs> this may sound crazy, but I choose my battles. You you eat or you get a bath. <laughs> he a little kid, so I kinda think he could slide with that mm-hmm. for now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right? But like, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. And then he has and, to figure it And he gets to decide, he gets though, to figure it right? Out. And that to, teaches him something. And that teaches him. Because then, and I said, I promise you, you're going to be hungry in the morning. That doesn't mean I'm now not going to feed him. But now what you also eat in the morning, I can't make you something in the morning. Our time slot is mm-hmm. small. So get this little box of so frozen flakes. So you, you, you can have that. I could put some dry cereal in the baggie for you. You can have this granola bar. Mm-hmm. You can have some fruit that's already cut up because I'm also not cutting up food in the morning for you. Mm-hmm. So that starts to give him that autonomy to make yeah. those decisions. Listen, like, what decisions so, make sense for what I really want? Right. Like, don't I want good food in the do I Do <laughs> I want to be hungry in the morning? <laughs> like, oh, I don't like that and feeling. And do I want to yeah. be tired? Because now yeah. I'm like, answer, wake up. Mm-hmm. Come on. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, not, like, ob- I'm, I'm not, not obnoxious tired. and I'm not yelling at him in the morning. Mm-hmm. But I say, this is what I was talking about last night. Get up, though. Mm-hmm. We got to go. You mm-hmm. got to get him moving. Because he gets himself dressed and he brushes his own teeth. He gets himself right. He packs a snack in the morning. Because if I got to get your sister, she's to my daughter's too. He can do that. Whether she's there or not, he does it. But let's go. Now, you guys <laughs> <gotta> go. spoke <laughs> about the top part of the spectrum, the better part of the spectrum. Actually teaching your kids through critical thinking moments. Like, okay, this or this, and the alternative is this, or the result is that. Mm-hmm. Versus the young lady in Wegmans who is like do this or else cursing it was a it it was harsh yeah what does that child learn from that how does that impact the child's that type of upbringing um i really want to talk about this um something that i think a lot of of our women deal with right we talked about this survival mode. We talk about fight, flight, or freeze, right? We talk about, remember, Dathan talked about prefrontal cortex, mm-hmm. like closed, mm-hmm. right? I'm only, I'm living in um, amygdala mode, right? I'm living in, like, the amygdala is with, like, the security guard of the brain. It's like, what information can get through? Because I'm, 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 I'm in a survival mode right now. I'm kind of, like, trying to perceive danger. So I'm not really letting anything through mm-hmm. except for, like, immediately like how I can get myself out of this danger or like almost like a security like protecting my brain from receiving anything else until I feel safe I'm like regulated right Mm -hmm. um and then there's this other thing that I like I've been doing some research on called functional freeze right and this is when you've lived in that heightened state of fight fight or freeze for a prolonged period of time right and that doesn't mean when I say flight fight or freeze I think some people think about like a real crisis happening right is that's not the only time that we live in that space, right? There are, like I told you, poverty, right? Like not knowing, not knowing where basic necessities are coming from is going to put you in a fight, fight or free state. Like, what do I do in mm-hmm. order to get these things, right? Um, relationship, you know, conflicts, um, like you said, abuse, all of these things are going to have somebody staying in a fight, flight or free storm for, state for a prolonged period of time, right? A, a stress. This could this could get to a point where you enter this phase, which is called functional freeze, where you still do the things you have to do in order to like go to Wegmans and get food, but you're completely kind of psychologically disconnected from that process. You are um, living in a chronic state of stress internally, knowing that you still have to like, if you're a woman who's living in an abusive relationship, right? And you have children, you have these things, you, you know, like there's not much you don't feel you don't feel powerful enough to kind of stop the things that are happening around you that abuse so you've kind of conformed to it you're like you know what it's happening i feel a little powerless to it but i still got to take care of my children so i still got to, i still have to so you function but you are not really feeling you are not really connected to the pain you're disassociating from mm. those things and i feel like the things that we still do in those times, the things that we still handle in those times, they are not done with the care that they should be done with, right? So if I'm in a supermarket and I'm in 
I'm feeling conic, conic stress. I'm in a fight, fight or freeze, or maybe I'm in a functional freeze. I'm in a free state, right? I'm doing this just because I got to get groceries. Like I am not taking the time and care to, you know, explain, explain <laughs> what my child is. I literally, this is just a function, right? This is just in my brain. I just need to get in this supermarket, get food and get back. And most of the times I'm like, completely emotionally depleted my children are not I'm, I'm and on the outside it looks like you know she's doing the thing she she makes mm. sure they in school every day mm. you know she got clothes on their back but nobody's looking at this woman the 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 internal environment that she's probably mm. dealing with and i'm not making excuses right I, I even before i came here I, there was something that popped in my head i said you know i want to give a charge to our men right to our to even to the women right like we have to be mindful about this narrative, this charge that we put on black women to do more, to be stronger, right? To take things. And I, I also said, like, if you, if you a man listening, when's the last time you, you know, encouraged a black woman around you to rest, right? Like to, to really, in, like, it's almost like I, we don't do, I don't, I'm not saying y'all do it consciously, right? But subconsciously, it's almost like we expect our women to be like handle it like you we grew up seeing our mothers never cry mm. handle hold it down a lot of men you know that's what they see from their mom like my mom she worked three jobs and she came home and she cooked for us and she cleaned for us and she ain't cry and she wasn't sad mm. she talked about no emotions so now when we get to partners what do you think we expect from these partners same thing we expect mm. them to be like super women and really and truthfully or you're weak <laughs> Cause like, yo, my mom, like, why are you acting like that? That's what women do. And they're like, I'm not supposed to have the weight of the world. Like, what do you think you're here for? It's so funny. I didn't, my mom didn't have no help, no help. Even in a house with brothers and sisters, most of them would be like, that's your child. I have to deal with my child. Mm -hmm. like, I, you're not going to ask me. I'll watch your kid from time to time. Mm -hmm. But at one point, even I remember we used to do Christmas and everybody would buy each other. And at some point it was like, no, you buy your child. Mm. I buy my child. And it's like, that was kind of where everything went. Everybody kind of just had to handle their own shit. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a community vibe no more. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to say, send a shout out to women though. With this conversation, I think I've spoken a lot. Yo, my mom, see, yo, my mom was... Yo, she tried her fucking best, bro. Like Period. every day. <laughs> Period. There was never a day where she didn't try her damn best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never. You know what I'm saying? Even if if we're talking about the corporal punishment or whatever, whatever, bro, she just really just wanted me to do well. And I don't think that she had the information or like how that would look 15 years later or whatever. Or, you know, if I would think about it in a way like, oh, you shouldn't have. You know, we none of us want to be punished in, in no way. I didn't think she thought about it like, oh. Um, but I do think this is more responsibility needs to be put on men. More responsibility needs, there needs to be more help from the fathers. Um, to like say my, my son yesterday, or well, the day before, the you know, he was giving the therapist some beef. And, like, really, like, in the bathroom, slamming the bathroom door. Slamming, slamming, slamming. Mm. And I was like, oh, you need me to come get you. Mm. Yeah. Oh, you, you think that this is the way men act. So, because you have a female therapist, you think that you can just do this to women. So, now my son is downstairs in the house with me. He's standing the rest of the week with me. And it isn't necessarily about punishment. It's like, yo, you need to see how men act. You need to see consequences in, in, in the, the things that you do that you could think about. How old is he? Um, 16, going on 17. He's aut autistic, though. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we, and we're having conversations continuously throughout the day. Like, are you okay? But I bet you would love to be there. But guess what? When you f impact, affect, I think this is the word, impact. No? <laughs> Say a sentence. I don't know you when you know. affect somebody <laughs> badly, there's gonna be consequences. Yeah. You know, and it, you know, I'm not angry at you, but you have to suffer some consequences 
for poor behavior. Imagine. What do you think, Danielle? You thinking? <laughs> yeah. What are you thinking? I am like the Nazi of language. I tell my clients mm-hmm. all the time I'm a stickler for the words we use because they have power, mm-hmm. right? So we want to be careful. We want to be mindful. Um, sometimes it is a matter of semantics, so I get I can get a little anal about it. But you said suffer consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And so I'm trying to like visual like. That shit. He was like, ooh, I don't like that word, like, suffer. Why are you saying that? And again, like, <laughs> it could be my own shit. I know mm-hmm. I got stuff to work on. But like, what does that what does that mean? And I don't know if you and I don't I don't know if you said that to him. Well, I'm gonna or tell not. you like this. I learned corporal punishment from my mom, mm. right? Mm. I had to look at my kids one day and was like, "Why am I doing this? They're not learning from this. This yeah. they're not. This is not something that is beneficial in any manner mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. We're literally just trying to get them to listen to me or else." So that's a self, right? It's a selfish. It really sometimes isn't even about them. It's about us. We are trying to manage. We're trying to navigate whatever everyday kind of stress we got going on. And then once they do that thing, it like heightens it because it's like, yet here's now another thing I have to do. And we're talking about single moms. Mm. Another thing I yet have to do by myself. Mm. I have to be emotionally available for a six-year-old and a two-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, an 18-year-old, whatever the age of your child is. I have to, I know, at least for me, it is my responsibility to help nurture and support so mm-hmm. that they can emotionally uh, regulate, right, all the mm-hmm. things and articulate themselves and how they feel. And whatever I'm going through, if I'm at a high stress level, that little thing that they did, phew, sends it off. So sit down. Why are you doing that? Just stop, mm-hmm. right? And it's just like, oh, it was an accident. Mm. And there's well, also a, 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 a healthy level of shame and guilt that lives in there as well, too, right? So, like, when a kid is doing something, it's especially when you're so invested, because we're invested in our children's outcomes, right? Yeah. Like, we want them to be good. So, even that scenario you just used with the therapist, it's almost like, what does that mean about me? And Like, you know, what does that mean about me? Like, did I not teach my son better. how to mm-hmm. treat women? And we internalize that. So, as I'm also dealing with my own stress dealing with the fact that I need to be like stand up 10 toes down to be supporting you as you go through whatever you're going through. There's also these feelings of like, if I don't get this right, like what does that mean about me? Mm -hmm. Or what does this behavior that my child is exhibiting mean about how I am as a person? Like he's down there wilding on the therapist. Like did his parents not rate, like, you Mm -hmm. know, you thinking people, you know that people think like it's the parents. That's Mm -hmm. one of the narratives they put out there. It's I blame the parents. I blame the parents. So, Every day you live with that when you're parenting your children, you think about like what these behaviors, what these things mean about you as a person. You feel guilt because maybe I'm like not, I don't have all the things, I can't offer them all the things that I can't offer, like that I feel like they need right now. There's all kinds of other things that are attached to this process as well. So so it's like layers on layers on layers. Um, It may look like an interaction, right? But it's like a whole... Thing. spiritual emotional mm-hmm. um ball right kind of cycle that's going on inside both parties well danielle asks the word suffer mm-hmm. suffer consequences mm-hmm. and it's so you know while y'all were talking i was thinking i was just going on and on and on and i'm just like in my head i'm like man i'm still raising with fear mm. even as i'm trying not to Ultimately, mm. it's still a uh, that or else thing, or else what? Mm. Or else what? You're gonna show up, and you're gonna scare me to death. Again, when I went to my friend's house, and I saw how his parents raised him, I never felt that or else feeling. It would be you're not gonna be allowed to go to Cotillion. <laughs> Or you're not going to be allowed to, you know, have the things that you like if this happens. But it was never like a big bad wolf. Like a threat. It was never a threat. Mm. And even when I show up, right, I had to go up there. It's like, oh, dad's here. Oh, my God. Mm. Like, I don't want to raise my kids like that. But that is what I know. It's at the root of 
everything that I learned about parents and kids yeah. was like the or else moment. Mm-hmm. The unlearning is so much harder and it takes so much more time. It takes so much more time and sometimes we feel like, I don't got time for this shit. Like, I need you to because I have things to do because I, I made this plan with so-and-so. We got to go. Mm-hmm. I don't have time to sit and wait. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of natural consequences, though. Natural consequences. Natural. What does that mean? Some of my son don't eat his dinner. The natural consequences, he's going to be hungry in the morning. You, he, having that feeling in the morning, I don't know about you, but I don't like that feeling in the morning. <laughs> and I know, though, if I eat too late, too, I, my stomach will hurt in the morning. It's just a natural concept, right? So it becomes now teaching our children about, like, how to make choices, mm-hmm. right? And th- that's that critical thinking, right? You, so when we're, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. I should just, but I think <laughs> natural consequences. <laughs> it should, should just go. Natural consequences is, is, is really good. It's like an if then, right? Like it's almost like we're teaching our children a relationship of the choice, a re- the relationship aspect of the choices that they make, right? Like when you do X, Y, and Z, here's actually what happens, right? Like they have to know the, the, the con- we, we call it consequence, right? But they, they need to know the outcomes, the possible outcomes of the choices that they make. So like I say, if you don't do this, that takes away from this time, that takes away from this time, and you won't be able to actually have free time to watch TV later on. I'm just letting you know, because if mm. things are not done by mm. eight o'clock, we already established that 8.30 was the bedtime. Mm-hmm. So this time you're taking now, I just want you to have some foresight to think about how that's gonna impact your night later on. You know, it's kind of up to you actually it's really up to you really how you how your night goes and so that's what when we talk about natural consequences they need to start to learn how to take that ownership like no because they're truthfully everything we do causes a reaction Mm -hmm. every single thing we notice as adults Mm -hmm. and so we just are teaching our children that their actions have consequences not the ones that i impose on you the ones that actually happen as a result to that and helping them intentionally see that connection that relationship to what they did and what happened. Mm. So, okay. Got to maybe I need to learn more about natural consequences. Yeah. Natural. I mean, I think it's a conversation, right? Like, well, what do you want to do? Like when we used to work in the school, sometimes I'd say, "Well, what do you think?" Or we would talk to the kids if they got suspended from the bus or like a conflict or whatever. How sh- how do you how would you like me to respond and how do you think I should respond? And they pick their consequence. They so, so give me candy. <laughs> no, <laughs> they never, but they never say that though. Like you and and like they never, really, they never say that. They don't say the thing that they want to happen. They they because they also learn from how we've given out consequences and from conversations we have, right? So now they kind of wait in their their option of whatever information I've been given in the past about how consequences or whatever work. They say I should. Sometimes, was, so we used to have them do reflections. They're like, I should do reflections. So I'd give, I'd say, well, you already do that, right? And that doesn't actually seem to be helping you because you've done reflections the last couple of times and we're still here. So now what? Mm. What has to happen? And I think there's some of that is, some of it is unearthing, right? Like sometimes kids don't understand that that's what's happened is actually a consequence. So when you talked about your son, the situation with your son, I absolutely think what you did was a natural consequence. I think that maybe the language, like you said, suffer the consequences, mm-hmm. all of that stuff. You could have told him like, this woman, this is her job, right? This is a human. You could have like let him, mm-hmm. when you put this level of stress on her, whatever, She's going to take time and she needs to be, you know, she doesn't want to do, she's going to need a moment. She's going to need to leave or maybe she's going to have to clock out early or whatever. You can kind of, and session is done. Mm -hmm. If you can't engage in the session, session is done. So now you come home like, or whatever. That is a natural consequence, right? Like when we hurt people, we have to deal with the fact that we don't have access to them really anymore, Mm -hmm. right? Like you actually have to do some repair work with that person. You, you was in her face or you was giving her a hard time, you know, until you're able to show her that you you, you can actually mm-hmm. engage in a respectful way with her, she might not come back. It's you know what I mean? Boundaries. It's so funny, if I may, very quickly, Danielle. Mm-hmm. Um, he wakes me up this morning. So yesterday, I went and got him. Long day. I had to go all the way to Bronx. I had to reschedule my day. I had things that I needed to do. But I was like, yo, the support that I could offer right now is taking him with me 
and that I think natural consequence was on was on my mind, and mm-hmm. it, without the word knowing the word was mm-hmm. like, yo, mm-hmm. you did this, now this has to happen, mm-hmm. and it's removed you from all the things that you like. But he woke me up this morning, and he basically came in the room and was like, I need to talk, mm. and I was like, I swear. <laughs> He came in the room and he was like, I need to talk. <laughs> and he worked through it. He's, you know, speech impediment. And he was like, I don't think I need the therapist anymore. Wow. I don't want the therapist. Right? Oh. Did he say why? That's powerful. So, <laughs> this is amazing. you know, I expressed, to him, I expressed to him that he has a right to his feelings. But the way that he expresses himself mm-hmm. has to go along a certain way. And what he did was scary and disrespectful. And when somebody tells him something, he needs to listen. He has to. He, can, he has a right to express himself. Mm-hmm. But when somebody tells you something, you need to listen and not act out, right? But when I sat him back down in the room, I went back in the room. I thought about what he said. I don't need therapists anymore, and he does need therapists. Mm-hmm. He has scoliosis surgery. Mm-hmm. He was in the hospital for a long time. First of all, he already has physical. Mm-hmm. Uh, impediments, I guess that's what the word is, um, just because of the autism. He's not able to do certain things, but because his back is now very straight, mm-hmm. he has to learn how to put his pants back on mm-hmm. or how to put socks on mm-hmm. and things like that. So I sat in the room for a minute, and I came in, and I sat here with him, and I said, do me a favor, put your socks on. And he struggled to put the socks on. And I said, Amari, do you remember when you could put the socks on? I said, that's what the therapist is trying to help you Mm. get back to the point where you can put your socks on. And he said, put my socks on? And I said, yes. And I said, I know it hurts. I said, remember daddy's arm was in a sling recently, remember? He said, yeah, daddy's arm was hurt. And I said, Amari, I hated therapy, just like you hate therapy. Mm. I didn't like it. But my arm works now. And he was like, your arm works. And I was like, you, you need therapy. And that's why everybody's trying. So mm. this is something. I'm a t- I- we proud of you. I just yeah. want to clap it up for you. No, that, no. that interaction <laughs> was so <laughs> good. Yeah. We love that. <laughs> Y'all going to say this. That's a great high, but. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I didn't have that. Growing right. up. Yeah. It was, you did what? Mm-hmm. You get spanked mm-hmm. and you act correctly or else you're also going because what I said, said so, so. Mm-hmm. right now again this is not about my mom this is really is not because again this is how what she learned mm-hmm. and I think that this was a whole cultural thing back mm-hmm. then it really was and when I said oh we love so many more words now <laughs> this is kind of we have way more information we, we are studying the, the social media and the sharing of information has allowed us insight into so many other rooms and so many other uh, families, or, you know, experiences. And so I'm like, yo, when I was able to, to kind of do that this morning, I was proud of myself. Mm-hmm. I was very proud of myself. And it was because I allowed him to see what we were trying to teach him. Just through, let him, listen to him, express to him certain shit. How did you get there? To do that with him? Um, that started with, that's been a long road for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I realized that I was spanking autistic kids, mm-hmm. like what? Mm-hmm. That's the most ignorant. You're dumb. You're dumb. Like that's literally, what are you doing? They don't even speak real, en- the same English that you speak. This, what you're doing it didn't help you, so how, I don't know. It was just, I had to relearn communication. I had to relearn what I was giving to them and what I was hearing from them and why they were doing things and stuff like that. And it, it, was, a, it was a long, long process of me studying them because they can't express everything mm-hmm. the, or not in the way that I would e- express it. Mm-hmm. So now I have to pay more attention to the behaviors, to the things that they, they uh the things that they go to versus the things that they don't. Mm-hmm. Okay, why isn't he? What is it that's affecting him adversely? And, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I think I've gotten really good with that. Especially with, say, say my mom still is in her way of doing yeah. things. So I'm like, my, 
If he's doing that, there's a reason he's doing that. Now, if only we looked at children who aren't autistic the same way. Mm. I was just about to say that. <laughs> I was What I heard in your story was that you're learning that all behavior serves a purpose, right? It's really, literally a function of like it's a means to an end a lot of people get caught up on the behavior but it really just points to something else right it's like the antecedent like right it's the and it's like the behavior like because of this thing i did this but it's really just to get this like maybe i need attention like really and truthfully i think there's like maybe five or six things that if we really boil it down that in this whole world that a behavior points to like either i'm like I need, I have a basic need that needs to be met, right? Like I need attention, love and belonging, right? I, um, yeah. Uh, power. Right. Fear. I don't, I mean, there's like, there's, there's like, it's really simplistic when you think about like everybody, almost even when you go to like Kings, Queens, it's like the same. (laughs) Yeah. The same. Yo, y'all just. Holy shit! Boiled that down blew to my mind. yeah, yeah, <laughs> because yeah. Because we, just, I'm not able. I'm normally I'm not able to to look through the action into the reasoning why. I'm just not. I just mm. feel the action and I respond to the action. But there's a reason you're doing that. And if I could get to that, I can help you solve this problem or this miscommunication between us. And that's even more than just kids. It's adults. This is adults. It's like everybody. everything. Is that, yeah. Behavior is what it is. Like, we think we more complicated than we are. <laughs> and we really just animals. Like, really, really, like, truthfully, like, behavior is a, it, it serves a purpose. It's like, you know, I'm doing this because I'm doing this because, like, that's what it is. And I actually was able to, I, I had to think to what, from the therapy, I said, it hurts. It's his back. It's strenuous. This hurts. So he's saying I don't like it because I don't like the pain that associates with y'all trying to stretch me. Mm-hmm. To that, that hurts. I don't like it. And I'm going to push you to take it a step further. And remember, we were talking before about being curious. Be curious with your child. Like, allow, give him that language, right? Because he probably doesn't even have that language. Or maybe he does. I don't know your son, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe feel like I can vocalize that something hurts because that's, I'm not supposed to be in pain or I'm not allowed to feel pain. What was going on? Because if he can tell you, I don't want to go, I don't need it, then he definitely, but he has to be given the language. Mm-hmm. He has to be given the space to communicate like, it hurts. Like what's happening? What happened? Like ask him what happened. What happened at therapy? Talk to me from the time you walked in and it allow you to recognize some things and then give it language mm. and he can connect to it. So now when that thing happens again, he can say, dad, when I was doing this stretch or therapist, this is hurting versus I don't have the language. I got to like, I don't know how else to release that frustration or the sadness or the pain other than banging the door. What's your son's name? Amari, I had to Amari. think about it. That's bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's because they twins. <laughs> they twins. You have to think about which twin was it. That's <laughs> I was like, yeah. Um, go ahead. What are you gonna no, do? I was just saying, but let's for a minute, let's just sit and think that that conversation with you never happened, right? Let's think about that situation. Let's say it was mom that you mm-hmm. seen in Wegmans was mm-hmm. Amari's mom, right? And she, he, Amari. She's she's at work. They call him and say, I can't do therapy with him right now because he's over here Shut throwing up. the things. She comes in. She grabs Amari up. She don't want to hear nothing that he got to say. Amari, you better get back that. And that happens continuously, right? Amari's struggling. He's in pain. He don't know what to say. He don't know what to do. He don't know how to tell mom that he's in pain. Mom is screaming. Mom grabbed him up. Let's talk about that cycle. Mm-hmm. What do you think that then means for Amari when we talked about what it looks like on the other side. How does that child grow up? What does that behavior, that behavior then morph into the bully? Well, we talked about all of that. Like, let's take a minute to think about what Amari's experience would be, right? If you didn't have that conversation with him, you just punished him. You just went in on him, kept going. Do he had to know? keep going to therapy. He did it again. And then you got, you even, now you up in it. I told you. Mm-hmm. You do it. You do it. You did it again. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with you? Now it's just <laughs> let's just let's just say nothing disrupts that cycle. Mm-hmm. Nothing disrupts that cycle. It's like you did it. Now I'm punishing. Now you up in it because you you in pain, but you really still have. Now you even more like shell shocked. Like I don't have the words, but I also know that I like 
really can't, I'm not supposed to do this. Like you almost, this kid is like cornered. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? He don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. What does that mean for somebody? Like um, for a I child? I really want to know. Do y'all have any experience with that? Like with a, a child that's just been, su- they've been told to suppress their feelings or, you know, not being able to make their own choices or not having those th- critical thinking moments and are consistently met with. You become a people pleaser. But it doesn't that sound familiar to you, though? Yo, that's don't what say I that. said. <laughs> that's why I was trying to go with it, Tom, uh, Sakai, <laughs> right? I was like, you told me that, you know, you didn't have that, like, a, a, so that's what I'm trying to say. We would, I was giving you an example to think about your son from a different vantage point, but think about that kid. Like, who, who is that who kid? Who does that remind me of? Who is that kid and who does that kid become? Like, a person who just does things to make everybody else happy so that you don't get mad at me, mm-hmm. so that you don't not like me. Mm-hmm. Even lose yourself in it. Mm-hmm. Don't know who you are in the middle of it because everything you're doing is to get the smiles from everybody else. It's not genuine. And a lot of times you aren't really connected to who you are because it's the pug, the whole you is like a piece of you, a piece of this home, a piece of that school, a piece of that person. And you're like one piece. A very small piece. A very small piece. And so what is a very small piece compared to 90 my 90 whole life, I versions just, of I'm just, me well, that people I have in their head? Yeah. I don't know if it's my whole life, but I, I can honestly say that this sounds like me. Just making sure that everybody else is okay and losing myself in the process. Completely like, yo, I just don't want nobody to not like me. Where are you now? I don't know. Okay. I don't want to make something up. Yeah. I, I'm literally just f- figuring this out. Okay. Uh, I spoke to my friend the other day. He's pissed that I didn't come to his birthday party. Mm-hmm. I said, Mouse, I didn't have it. I had to choose me, bro. Like, I love you. I called you the next day. I called you the day of, and I called you the next day. Mm-hmm. But I knew I needed a moment that day, and I didn't want to do something I didn't want to do just to make you happy. I didn't want to do it. Ooh, powerful. You just yeah, clap on that, right? You know what I'm <laughs> like, clap. <laughs> clap, clap. That's a big moment for me. Mm-hmm. Huge, mm-hmm. right? You know, and I've been doing it more often. And I think it's uh, allowed me the power to choose when Mm. I can, you know, rather than feeling compelled to. And that's a world of difference when it comes to. It's a time boundary. Boundaries? Somebody told me that you don't have boundaries. You don't know boundaries. And so you're not only a habitual lines crosser, but you also let people do it to you yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you just like, it's like you don't even know how to. And I'm like, yo, that's okay. They're the hard. They're hard. That's, it's incredibly difficult, especially when you, you've you been living as a people pleaser for mm-hmm. so long. Mm-hmm. And, and <laughs> no, go ahead. And, you, and you're functioning under this narrative that I need everyone, right? I need to be liked. Because then there's validation of who I am and what I say I am. Because if not, then I'm not who I say I am. Exactly. Uh, I've, I've, since then, learned to tell people, learned to tell myself, because I didn't, I didn't actually say it to anybody else, but that's not my friend. Why are you trying to make friends out of somebody that's showing you they're an acquaintance? Mm. Like... Everybody, you, you don't need that. Mm-hmm. You don't need this relationship or you don't need to like keep feeding, pouring into people that are dark holes because they don't want to be your friend. Mm-hmm. They're, y'all are cool, mm-hmm. which is fine. But you're like ex- overextending and extending and feeling exhausted from what you think is betrayal or from, you know, just not people pouring back into you. You're not getting the same shit from you, but they're showing you where they are with you. Mm-hmm. Trust and them. You're not, Believe them. You're not accepting that. <laughs> and I, so the whole people pleasing thing was me. It really helped me realize, like, oh, this is you. You're making yourself feel that way mm-hmm. because you're doing all of this to get this response from these people mm-hmm. that have already shown you where they are. And it's not a bad thing. It's you need to stop. <laughs> stop. Yeah. 
And mm. since then, I just, I feel so relieved, mm. right? Um, at the ability to be able to do that. Um, so yeah. Okay. Can I say something to yes. that? Okay. Go. Okay, you know, go. I was just talking about boundaries because <laughs> boundaries was something that I really was thinking about because I, I struggled with that so, so deeply. Like mm. I, I struggled with that. Um, like you said, I think like once I once I thought that if I put limits on people or expectations on people, right, that that meant that they would like have an opportunity to say no, I'm not doing that and exit. And what I and I I realized that it was my mindset around boundaries was that it was limiting. That it was like when we think about boundary, we think that it's gonna like sh- s- s- like small make things smaller, right? Mm-hmm. Like make our area of uh, mm-hmm. accessibility smaller. But I realize that it actually expands mm. our environment, right? Like, it literally gives us opportunity to indulge in the things that actually serve us, mm-hmm. are for us, mm-hmm. that are aligned with us in a more mm-hmm. wholesome way, it's right? It's concentrated. It takes away the things that don't really belong in our that environment and gives us more space mm. to indulge in the things that do. And that's what that was the mind shift for me because I, I always looked at boundaries as like restrictive. Mm-hmm. Like, oh God, I'm gonna have to, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. shorten my circle. I'm gonna have to like mm-hmm. take the, I looked at it in a way of like things being taken away from me, but mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, it's actually adding more time, right? Now I have more time mm-hmm. to do the things that actually speak to my soul. Now I have more, you know, love, right? Cause it's real. This is the real love. This is the real stuff. Now I have more, you know, more of that because I'm not wasting energy and time on things that are actually not really I would say, for me. So I would say that it's allowing you to focus on the things that serve you. Yes. And let go of the things that don't, that are crowding you, that are like watering down up space. your experience. They're taking up too much space. And so, what you know, you're, I told you I only have six words. Let me get the sixth one. Hold on. You're, 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 uh, you say that you, you, you draw this diagram. You drew mm-hmm. this diagram in front of us. was like, oh, this is going to constrict it. Mm-hmm. But no, it's actually you pouring way more into yourself. And, and instead of all of these other things that are just taken away from you, that are really minimizing so really have it, more now. Shit. Like, yo. It's more. Yeah. It's, a, it's a mindset of more. I'm like, I want more of the things yeah. that I really want. It's your yes And to less you. of the things that I don't want. Boundaries That's are it. your yes to you. I always say yes. boundaries are not about no to you, but yes to me. How mm-hmm. do you teach each other? How do you teach children boundaries? Um, when I have to have my own, right? So, my children, we're playing, and then it's time to stop, right? You're my physical boundary. Okay, I don't want to be touched anymore. I don't want to play in this way. Stop. You have to, right, like, I know we were playing, so now now it's conversation. I know we were playing, but right now I want to take a break, right? So you and your sister can continue playing if she wants to, but when someone says stop, you have to stop, right? The mm-hmm. same way when you say stop to someone, I want them to honor that because you get to decide when you want to play and when you don't want to play, mm. right? It's, it's all about, we have to be having these conversations. And they're about, you know, to your point, they're, I tell clients, they're your personal laws. They're about how you are, you are going to exist. And so don't create boundaries for relationships. They're just the foundation for everything. Mm-hmm. They're about, this is how I move in the world. And if you want to be here, does that, how does that align with how you live? Mm-hmm. And I get to decide if I actually want you here and you get to decide if you want me here. But if they don't have boundaries, I really have to make that decision. But I have to be clear about it. Right. Like this is how I move in the world. I don't play about my time. So I'm calling you where the hell you at. <laughs> right. Or if you're going to be late, give me a heads up because then I can have more flexibility. But when you don't, I'm not picking you up anymore. You're going to have to drive next time. Right. Because it's about my yes to me and me honoring my time to give me more time. I want to get to this thing early. I don't want to be late. You like to be late. So let's just drive separately. That's I'm, I'm not even offended because it's not about me. I get to decide. Mm. And it allows us to have more control. Mm. I really love that. Um, where wh- I begin and you end. I yeah. always say that. It's where I begin and, you and end. where you end. Like 
that's my and i wish that's a great title in itself (laughs) where i begin where i begin and you end that's a book y'all should write a book (laughs) we got a lot of things in us believe me yeah you you know thank you for that yes yes you have your cards have we attacked the things that you um let's see like in your cards I know she brings uh, these cards. And she's like, oh, I don't want her to be like, oh, I sh- I mean, we never got to this. <laughs> so, um, I feel like we kind of really, we really did, but um, we talked about like, what do you think those interactions with your mom, those those early interactions, those things that you remember about your discipline and your upbringing, mm-hmm. what do you think? Because we, we just mm-hmm. talked about that, like how to make it, how yeah, you yeah, make man. you into, as a person. So I think yeah. we kind of work, worked into that. Um, I don't know if parents really think about the effect their upbringing is going to have on the child. Because we're just, especially when you low finance, when you, you have, when it's hand to mouth, life is hand to mouth. I don't have time for the extra coloring mm-hmm. into all of that. I'm trying to make sure you eat. I'm trying to make sure you stay out of trouble. I'm trying to make sure the streets don't get you. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to make sure I'm doing the best. Like your dad left and you didn't lose much. And I don't think that that transfers into, okay, who you're going to be at 25, 26. We don't realize how all of that stuff impacts there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think we also parent with the narrative of like I didn't get this or I was treated this way and so I know what you need mm. and especially when sometimes the upbringings seem like they mirror mm-hmm. right but we have to remember our children aren't us and even despite that the so if I was raised by a single mom now I'm a single mom, right? I'm assuming my kid needs what I needed. Mm. My kid's different. Mm. Like they got my blood flowing through them, but they also have their dad's blood flowing through them. Mm-hmm. And so they may perceive the experiences very differently. And so it's really like coming from a space of, I know what I know, but I also don't know what I don't know. Mm. And with my children, that's where it best applies because I don't know who they're gonna be. Mm. And they really are experts in some of their needs and Mm -hmm. so how much space are we offering them to say like hey i actually don't like that and that's how you teach boundaries i actually don't like that yeah and it's okay like my my son tells me he told me one time we uh we were moving to jersey and we went to ikea and i don't know what he did there's something i must have fussed him out but we're in key and i might have like said hi but you know people pass by we we Mm -hmm. say hi he says mommy how come you're happy with everyone else and not me Mm. <laughs> what did I do? But I was so happy that he could express that because now I have to reflect. Like mm-hmm. to your point, what does that mean? Right? When we're oh he didn't he received that a particular way and that's the best way he could communicate. So now it's a conversation. So I said, I'm not, not happy with you, but I told you to do something, you didn't listen, so I get frustrated. Right? And so it's not that I I'm not happy with you and I'm happy with everyone else. But sometimes when you don't, it's frustrating that you don't listen. Mm. I really enjoy this um, conversation because I feel like this is a, I I walked into this Mm -hmm. wanting people to take something away that was useful, something that they could actually put to practice. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now, a lot of us don't know how to have those kind of conversations with our children past i just need you to do it yeah because i know it's good for you Mm -hmm. but we don't realize how much we're shorting our children from a learnable or teachable teachable moment by actually saying okay this is what you did what do you think happens what did you want to have happen um how do you think that would have been a better a better way to get that to happen so that say mommy wouldn't wasn't frustrated. Now don't get me wrong, I tell my child, mm-hmm. every time is in a conversation. Mm-hmm. If the house is on fire, I don't have time to explain to you to get your butt downstairs, mm-hmm. right? And so again, I, I make the distinction matters of safety. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's just like, because of your choosing, 
we don't have time to we don't have time for this conversation in this moment mm -hmm. we can have it tomorrow but right now you still got to go to bed right like and i think it it really it's hard i'm not perfect at it i really am not i'd be losing my shit a lot but i try my best to come back to the conversation i could try to come back to all right what was happening <laughs> like what were you thinking what mm -hmm. was like why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Like, what the hell? And 95% <laughs> of parenting is our own emotional regulation. Mm -hmm. mm. I feel like that's the part that we, when you say, like, how do you do this? Sometimes just take a breath mm -hmm. and the things will come to you. You will know what to say and do. You are not actually getting critical information through your brain when you are upset and frustrated with your child yeah. and we really I, I look at parents we are like the temperature we are the 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 thermostat right and mm -hmm. a lot of times our emotional state is the very thing that is making the situation heightened and alert and in mm -hmm. and in a crisis so i guess my like my number one thing and this is why i talked about we talked about mom's capacity we talk about that mom and wegmans right all mm -hmm. the things she's going through I know we we know we we've sensationalized self care and some people look at it as like this you know get your nails done yeah like it's some like you know <laughs> fancy fee fee foo foo thing right Not but it's food. really when I talk about this I mean I'm I'm seriously saying this right like we have to take care of ourselves because we cannot like pour from an empty cup we will give our children shit. Like, I'm going to be honest. Right. They're going to get the worst of us, right? Because mm -hmm. like you said, we can't curse our boss out. We ain't mm -hmm. cursing our boss out because we got it. We make mm -hmm. sure, you mm -hmm. know. But if I'm, all of this, this, this is built up all day, guess who's going to get the short end of that stick? And our children don't deserve that. Like, these are the people that are going to carry our legacy, right? That are going to, like, like you say, almost break general generational curses and do all kinds of things, right? That we can, you see how, each generation progresses. Like you said, mm -hmm. we have all this information. Imagine the information that our kids are going to have mm -hmm. and what the capability, like what the potential and possibilities are going to be then. We want to prepare our children to be able to like, to exist in that world. Mm -hmm. Right. To and excel that's going to take, that yes, to excel in that world, to, to um, compete in that world. So we really need to give them the tools they need to do that. And it's going to require like at the foundational level, it's going to require us to regulate ourselves. Right we cannot expect children who have not even don't even have access to their prefrontal cortex yet right so they're 25 years old to have more self-restraint in an argument right in an interaction than we do if we go on like shut the fuck up what are we expecting from that child in that moment what do you mean they don't have access to it oh yeah they it's not fully developed their prefrontal cortex a child's prefrontal cortex which is Another thing I will leave y'all with, and this is something y'all can, you know, research is executive functioning skills, right? We start to look at ourselves, each one of ourselves as an enterprise, right? Like I'm, an, I'm my own enterprise. I'm my own entity, right? And there's certain skills I need in order to be, a, to effectively run that entity. Planning and prioritization, right? Time management. This is, this is called executive functioning skills. Mm -hmm. Goal oriented persistence, emotional control. There's task, a whole list of them. Task, task persistence, persistence. Task initiation. Yes. These are all things that they have. Knowing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look it up. Executive functioning skills. There's a whole, there's a whole thing about it. You're going to see, you're going to open up your whole mind. Yeah. You'll be able to pinpoint where the gaps are in your children and see it from a more of a like, it's like a business model, right? Like I'm a whole, think about it. Our bodies, our system, all the systems that's in our body. We're a whole entity. Mm -hmm. And we need certain skills in order to, like an executive would need in order to run his business, right? To run our lives. And so um, when we talk about the prefrontal cortex, that's not fully developed until a person is 25 years old. So they don't actually even have the ability to make some of these high level decisions with clarity yet right mm -hmm. they are functioning in the primal part of their brains they are functioning in the emotional parts of their brains right and so they're making decisions based on how they feel social like <laughs> my friends want to be doing like this is the most important thing they're not like you know i know my mom's at home she just worked mm -hmm. uh, a double shift and i know that like you know rent is due probably the first of the month and if i you know act I mean, out right that. now right if i act out right now it's probably gonna affect the way that she can't go to work tomorrow they're not thinking about that they're like 
what's in front of me right now? What do I want to do? Mm. How can I express this little bit of autonomy that I'm trying to develop and um, have fun? Truthfully, that's mostly what they want. Yeah. <laughs> like, experience life. So, I learned a lot today. I appreciate y'all. Um, Shanita, you got your website up yet? I do. You said you didn't have it up yesterday. I do. I have it up. Um, it's there was a little issue with the domain <laughs> person, but you know what? I'm gonna give y'all the version that um, I have, and you can access it. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Sorry, guys. Give me a second. Mouse is getting on my nerves about his baby shower. Shower. He's like, you ain't coming to my birthday party. You gotta make it to my baby shower. Oh All right. wow. It's a whole different person. I can't I can't miss their first event. <laughs> Danielle. Yes. Miss Danielle Goods. Yes. Goods or good? Good. Good. Well, she do got the goods. Right here. Whoa. I mean, what like, show are we talking about? What no, show is this? No, I mean, like for the we just did the good. We just good showed information. you the good. Oh. Good information. Okay. Come on now. Sorry, I didn't know where my brain be going. Yeah. My bad. You right. Yeah. I, I went that's there me. Too. It's okay. That's all. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, where can these people find you? And do you have services? Like, are you bookable right now? I know a lot of therapists are booked to, to capacity. Yeah, I'm not at the moment. Um, and I'm not heavy on the social media mm -hmm. um, as a like, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I have an email. Um, I have Instagram. Mm -hmm. I have a mother. I have a mom page. What's the best way to, to find you as far as prof professionally? Um, the good therapist at gmail dot com. The G O D therapist. G O O D E. Okay, the good the therapist. The good therapist at gmail dot com. That's a fire email. That's a fire email. And you offer your services again. What do you mean? The services that you oh, offer the, as a therapist? Um, the specialties? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I do um, talk therapy. Mm -hmm. Sessions are 45 minutes to an hour. I give homework. Um, yeah. The, do you take insurance? I don't take insurance. You don't? Okay. No, insurance is a bitch. It, I know. I heard. It's not. I heard. And Shanita? Mm -hmm. what do you, okay. What do you it is collectivecapacityllc.com. Mm -hmm. That's where you can book a call, a consultation with me, um, and we can work on this uh, process of clearing the path, right? Mm -hmm. um, unearthing those things that are blocking you from reaching your full potential or accessing those things that you desire. So we we'll work for I want to thank you both so much. Um, you actually gave me a lot to walk away with today. Um, Shanita, we actually have another episode coming this Friday okay. with Dathan. Yes, Dathan. Dathan. Um, we, we recorded the yeah, room. Yeah, I was watching that looking like, what? Who boy? But, yeah, I'm not even sure how I'm going to release these episodes. Um, the first one was just so heavy. Again, thank you so much. Um, Danielle, you very much so helped me work through um, certain things when it comes to communication with myself. Um, Shanita with um, people pleasing where it comes from and you guys together help me figure out like okay setting up boundaries is um, how you work on ending that um, cycle of course for me I would want to speak to the people out there in the community and just be like all right where are you right now with your parenting right um, I'm gonna speak to the guys first bro the mothers need you. Mm. I know very often we look at, we like, oh, she does this, she does that. A lot of times, bro, she's on her last leg with raising these children and doesn't feel like she has the resources, doesn't feel like she has the support. And it's like, yo, if you're not there, you really can't judge her for what she's doing at her like last percentile of energy. Like you have to go get your kids and you have to help um, implement some of the things that you've heard today. Uh, forgive your ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend or ex-partner or whatever. And y'all learn to work together on raising those children. The children need that. Um, 
Bars. My Instagram page, <laughs> Mothering Like a Mother. I mm. do more parenting content mm. on there. Okay. Um, Mothering Like a Mother. That's mm-hmm. fire. Mm-hmm. Is that for men on Instagram. and women? Yeah, for men and women. I, I have a lot of moms up there, and so there's more plans to expanding it and having mm-hmm. more dialogue. Um, but I do like some TikTok videos, and I post it to that page, and it's mm-hmm. about like discipline or how to advocate for your child in school. So I do different topics, mm. um, very relatable because I stem it just from my own personal experiences mm. with my kids. Love that. I'm actually going to fo- fo- um, follow that page okay. um, just because I think that even dads, y'all could be mothers too. And that's just the way that we look at it. I know it's like, oh, mothers, no, you'd be a father. But it's like, yo, we always think that the mom's supposed to do most of the raising. And it's, it's not no true. Tree. It's both of us, bro. Mm. You know, the mm. father's supposed to be have an equal impact on that child's life as the mom and we kind of think that it's their job Mm -hmm. and it's not we're we're, we're failing our children if we incorporate that line of thinking but um you can start today you can literally call your kid today right now i'm coming get you out to school right now i'm taking you for some ice cream right today and let's talk you can literally just you know how did you feel you know Mm -hmm. stop asking your kids how was um school today and they say good and you go okay say what's your favorite part of the day yeah who did you sit next to yeah Let's start teaching your children. Your critical thinking is one of them things that is such a, it's so needed in uh, mm-hmm. adults, bro. Mm-hmm. We're making the silliest decisions because we're not thinking through. This co- prefrontal cortex thing that you taught me today um, or that Dathan exactly. spoke about, mm-hmm. bro, mm-hmm. I get to the light yesterday and I see a guy that I don't like. <laughs> On my corner selling drugs. On my corner. Mm. And he's never, nobody sells drugs on this corner. I've always kept this corner very clean. Because mm-hmm. uh, my mom, and you know, just a very quiet corner and everything. Mm-hmm. He's standing on the corner selling drugs. And I'm like, oh, he's disrespectful. Like, oh, this nigga. He know I don't like him. He's going to stand on my corner. Mm. And the light wasn't green yet. It was red and, and there was still time. And so I'm looking at him and I said, prefrontal cortex, think. Think you're Take mad. A deep breath. You're mad. And so I said, eight seconds in, something like that. I know breathe in for a certain amount of time, hold it for seven seconds, and then release it. And then like release four, it for yeah, four, four seconds. Four. Mm-hmm. And when I got to the releasing seven, it got it turned me into, bro, you're not a street nigga no more. You got your kid in the car. That's gonna the street's gonna take care of him. They're gonna don't worry about this. This is like literally not your problem. Go about your business. You got to cook this kid some some dinner. <laughs> like, what are you going to do right I'm now? I'm living a whole different what, life what are now. You, I'm living a whole, like, what are you thinking right now? And, and his I behavior, just drove right? Right by. His behavior is yes. within the need. And, and it was it was so useful. The eight, it was eight, seven, four? I think it is eight, seven, four. I would have to. Yeah, I think it is. Or it's seven, eight, four. But mm-hmm. I think that one second can go either way. Um, <laughs> y'all, I appreciate you guys for listening to So Shameless today. Um, you already know hit us up at soshamelesspod at gmail.com if you have any commentary you can hit us up soshamelesspod on Instagram um, also Shanita1023 on Instagram or collective capacity LLC dot com dot com mm-hmm. love you Melly bye <laughs> y'all too get the hell out of my house not y'all <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah.